The Aztecs by Nigel Davies Chapter 7 A Man in His Prime Not long after the events narrated above, Ahuitzot died in the year 1502 at a comparatively early age. It is suggested that his death was indirectly caused by the Great Flood, the delayed result of a blow on the head when he was escaping from inundation. Duran, on the other hand, attributes his death to some kind of intestinal malady contracted on his last and longest campaign, leaving himself so emaciated that he appeared almost fleshless. The most solemn funeral rites were performed, surpassing in pomp those of former sovereigns. Notwithstanding the violence of his disposition, the late ruler had been admired for his genius and loved for his bounty. The orations were more fulsome and the offerings more lavish than ever before and, while the first were addressed to his earthly remains, the second would provide for his comforts in the hereafter. That indefatigable orator, Nesahuapili, as usual, rose to the occasion. After employing all the metaphors appropriate to a great monarch, he reminded his l listeners of the aura of deep sanctity surrounding the office of Tlatuani. Now is filled with dust and dirt, the seat of the Almighty God, which you kept clean, whose likeness you represented, and in whose name you governed, removing from it all terrors and thorns. He abjured the departed ruler to rest in peace, and assured him that his own servants, as well as other slaves, would be duly dispatched to the next world to serve him there, as on earth. The ashes of Awitzal were buried in an urn at the side of the great stone of the sun. When it came to choosing a successor, for the electors it was a case of embarras de richesse. The new generation which had grown up included a plentiful supply of sons of the previous three, three rulers, Awitzalt and his two brothers. It was once more Nesahuapili who spoke first, pointing to the wide range of candidates at their disposal. Even if none of the sons or nephews of the last sovereign was preferred, then the other princes of royal lineage abounded, already of mature age. Many had held important rank in the military and religious hierarchy, as was to be expected in a community where not only the sovereign but the whole royal family aspired to be the highest offices of state. The ruler of Takuba, the other surviving head of the alliance, also spoke, pleading in particular that they should not elect a raw youth or a dotard. The empire required a man in his prime. Both he and Nesahuapili laid emphasis upon the perils that beset them both of rebellion from within and attack from without. Implicitly, they gave vent to a feeling that the empire was becoming overextended. It now stood at the parting of the ways. A mature statesman was needed to control its destinies and to consolidate its, its gains. The electors chose Moctezuma Shokoyotzin, son of Ashayakat, and nephew of Awitot. He was 34 years old. Like his predecessor, he held when elected one of the two leading army commands. While also renowned for his political wisdom, he excelled above all in the arts of war. He had already displayed the greatest valor and shown an invincible spirit on the field of battle. In spite of the many apparently suitable candidates, the choice had been fairly simple. They, ele they elected Moctezuma II with so much ease, as previously mentioned, because all eyes were turned on him with that end in view. For, as well as being the most valiant, he was grave and temperate, so that people marveled when they heard him speak. And when he made a discourse in the Supreme Council, he did it with such wisdom and aptitude that all wondered. And thus, before becoming king, he was feared and revered. Nesahuapili summoned up the situation by affirming that the gods had surely shown their love for the city in providing for the choice of a ruler of such strength and courage. All accounts of the new sovereign stress his great piety, apart from his other qualities, and after his election he was found in a temple, attending to his religious duties. He was, however, not without faults, as will later become apparent. He took great care that all the temples, and more especially the great temples, should be well served, cleaned, and swept. However, the terror and panic instilled by auguries and false oracles of his gods were apt to abate his natural vigor and valor. He was most zealous in the punctual enforcement of his orders and the observance of his laws, and inexorable in the punishment of offenders. On occasions, he tested the probity of his judges by the indirect offer of gifts, and he found guilty even of the highest nobility, 
paid the corresponding penalty without hope of remission. He was the irreconcilable enemy of idleness, and to banish this vice from his dominions, he sought to keep all his vassals well occupied. His oppression of all his subjects, the excessive taxes which he imposed, his haughtiness and pride, and his extreme severity and punishment alienated many people, although on the other hand, he conciliated by his liberality, both in providing for the necessities of his peoples and in rewarding the services of his captains and ministers. Like his predecessors, Moctezuma now submitted himself to the established pre-coronation ritual, the, the piercing of the nose, the donning of the diadem and the royal robes, the ceremony of auto-sacrifice, and the days of penitence. The electors made speeches of usual prolixity, reminding him of his military functions, his social obligations, and his religious duties. You must go out and watch the stars to know their course and their signs, influences, and portents. Above all, you must take note of the morning star that, when it, when it appears, you may perform the ceremony of washing yourself free from blemish and anointing your, yourself with the divine pigment. You must care for the mountains and deserts where the sons of God go to do penance and to live in the solitude of caves. You must care for the divine springs and fountains. In reply, Moctezuma, at times so proud and haughty, displayed a seemly modesty. He tried three times to begin his speech, but was overcome by tears. Finally drawing himself up, he answered briefly, I would indeed be blind, most noble king, if I did not perceive that you have spoken thus, simply to do me honor, notwithstanding the presence of so many fine and noble men in this kingdom, you have chosen me the most inadequate of all for this calling. I possess few accomplishments required for such an arduous task, and know not what I may do, save to rely upon the Lord of creation to favor me, and to beg all those present that they may give their support to these my applications, my, my supplications. But Moctezuma's modesty was in part feigned. From the words of Nesahuapili, it can be seen that if the Tlatoani was not, like an Egyptian pharaoh, a god in his own lifetime, his status now verged onto the divine. Quite apart from the oriental ritual of his court, no one might look upon his face. He might not tread upon unswept ground. Others had to wear rough garments in his presence. Certain aspects of his life, such as private omissances to the morning star, placed him in a category apart from other mortals in his relation to the gods. In addition, he had joined a special role as a kind of supreme augur. Unluckily, Moctezuma's talents in this field were to be overtaxed by the horrendous events destined to overtake his realm. To learn of the great splendor surrounding the, the second Moctezuma, we are fortunately not limited to native sources, but can draw upon ample accounts by Spanish eyewitnesses. Thus, by anticipating a little order of events, it is possible to give a first-hand and graphic picture of how he lived, taken from his f future conquerors, already installed in Española, unbeknownst to the Mexican ruler. The Latoani's style of life is not likely to have appreciably changed in the intervening 17 years. The availability of Spanish accounts introduces a new phase in Mexican history. The information given by chroniclers and codices on pre-Hispanic Mexico is admirable for the fullness of its detail. However, these native sources tend to concentrate on the bare narrating of events and their accompanying ceremonies. On the other hand, the European cult of the individual led the Spaniards to write much more of the physical traits and private life of the main protagonists in the drama. It is perhaps fair to add that native informants could hardly be expected to describe Moctezuma's physical features, since they would have been promptly executed had they dared to look him in the eye. By contrast, Bernal Diaz del Castillo and Cortez waxed eloquent on such subjects and left vivid portraits of the ruler. These hard-living intruders had never themselves moved in royal cir circles or even dreamt of penetrating the court of Charles V. They were thus literally stupefied by what they saw of the great Mexican monarch and were as surprised by him as he was by them. Bernal Diaz says about the person of Moctezuma, the great Moctezuma was about 40 years old, of good height, well-proportioned, and slender. He was not very dark, but of the color natural for an Indian. He did not wear his hair long, but only long enough to cover his ears. He had few whiskers, dark and well-set and sparse. 
His face was a little long but pleasant, while his eyes were attractive, and he showed in his glance both affection and when, nece and when necessary seriousness. He was most clean, bathing every day in the afternoon. He had many women, daughters of, of lords, and he had two high chief chain's daughters for wives. When he enjoyed himself with them, he did it so discreetly that no one knew about it except some of the servants. He was completely free from the practice of sodomy, and the clothing he put on one day he didn't use again until three or four days later. And the, def and the deference towards his person on the part of subject rulers. And I noticed something else. When great lords came from afar concerning disputes or other business, when they approached Moctezuma's residence, they had to come barefoot and poorly dressed, and could not enter directly into the palace. They had to walk round a little to the side of the gate, for it would have been considered a mark of disrespect to enter at once. The conquistadors were, ast were astonished by Moctezuma's daily fare. His cooks prepared over thirty kinds of dishes for every meal, done the way he liked them, and they placed small pottery braziers under them so they wouldn't get cold. They prepared over 300 plates of the food Moctezuma was going to eat, and more than a thousand plates for the guard. Sometimes Moctezuma would go with his chiefs and st stewards, who would point out to him which dish was the, was the best and what birds and things were in it. Then he would eat what they suggested, but he didn't go to inspect the food often, and then only as a pastime. Every day they cooked chicken, turkey, pheasant, partridge, quail, tame and wild duck, venison, wild pig, reed birds, pigeons, hares, rabbits, and many varieties of birds and other things that grow in this country, so many that it would take a long time to name them all. The preparations for serving his meals were as elaborate as the repast itself. He was served on a very low table, on which they spread white clods and large napkins. Four very beautiful women brought water for washing the hands. When he began to eat, they placed in front of him a wooden screen, richly gilded. Four leading nobles were in attendance, and as a favor he would give to each a plate of what seemed particularly good, which they ate standing up, and without looking him in the face. He ended the meal with fruit, of which he ate little. He drank cacao from cups of fine gold. Sometimes at meal times he was attended by hunchbacks and jesters, while others sang and danced for his amusement. To these, he would give what remained of the food and the cacao. Cortez himself, in the main, confirms these accounts in his second letter to Charles V. He even adds the detail that the dwarves and hunchbacks had special quarters in the palace. Certain servants were exclusively dedicated to their service. Cortez was particularly impressed by the fine gardens and, above all, by the aviaries. These were ten special pools for marine birds of every kind. Those for birds native to the sea contained salt water. Each kind of fowl had its special diet. This included worms and fish. These favorite pets had 300 attendants. There was even a kind of bird hospital with specialists in the art of curing their infirmities. Bernal Diaz, though writing in extreme old age, displays a fine memory and a keen eye for detail. However, in speaking of the character of Moctezuma, he gives the continuous impression of a rather mild-mannered man, and often talks of his kindness and gentleness. It, it will, however, be clearly seen in the course of his narrative that, whatever the impression given to, his, to Spanish captors, his basic qualities were of a different nature, and he was the, re the reverse of kind or gentle in the treatment of his own people. The outward display had doubtless very little since the outset of his reign, and presumably originated before this time. But the qualities described by Bernal Diaz were not all characteristic of the newly elected Tlatoani, whose true character it is necessary to know if we are to understand subsequent happenings. These Spanish accounts are essential to an understanding of the life of Moctezuma and perhaps of his immediate predecessors, but they do not tell the whole story. Students of the conquest tend towards over-concentration on such versions. When assessing Moctezuma and the complexity of his re of his relationship with Cortes, but the Spaniards only saw the end of the saga, and careful note needs to be taken of native accounts of his character and actions during the earlier part of his reign. If only, if one only witnesses the final act of a drama, it is seldom easy to grasp the plot, let alone to assess the performance of individual protagonists. 
What the Spanish chroniclers could not fully understand was that the conquest came as the disastrous conclusion of an 18-year reign of a ruler whose pattern of behavior requires to be seen as a whole. The Moctezuma, who we observe as the craven captive, shackled by Cortez, lies poles apart from the, from the overwinning prince who became the great Latoani half a generation bef before. Spanish and native sources agree in stressing Moctezuma's gravity, piety, and intellect, but such qualities can manifest themselves in different forms. Native versions, often also based on the stories of those who had seen Moctezuma and lived in his times, paint a different picture of the man and of his earlier doings to that found in Spanish sources. Under different circumstances, the pious can also be fanatical, the grave pitiless, and intellect becomes arrogance. From these descriptions of the earlier Moctezuma, one gets the impression of a prince who was as hard on his subjects as upon himself. It should not be supp supposed from the ritual luxury that surrounded his person that he was a mere voluptuary. He was surely as moderate in his tastes as he was cautious in affairs of state where his constant aim was consolidation rather than all-out expansion. Moctezuma, though a seasoned campaigner, increasingly preferred to remain at the center of things, imposing his iron will upon his subjects. But if his approach to problems of state contrasted with that of his predecessor, he, w he was his equal in overbearing demeanor and in his ruthless treatment of his underlings, particularly if they had served a Huitzot. The difference between the two men lay in Awitzot's ability to win, a f to win affection and loyalty by a warm-hearted display of generosity. Moctezuma was by contrast colder and more calculating. In his treatment of inferiors almost a martinet, and in his religious zeal ne nearly a bigot. He is in fact depicted, though one might not think it to judge by later happenings, as the most feared of all the Mexican monarchs, literally striking terror into his subjects by his mania for precision and the severity of his punishments. But if he was implacable, he was also just. On one occasion he entered a garden when hunting. His fancy led him to pluck an ear of ripe maize. He then entered the house of the owner of the place, but such was the terror with which his name inspired that he found it empty. Eventually, the proprietor presented himself, making a deep obeisance. Then, to Moctezuma's astonishment, the man asked him how he came to bear st stolen ears of maize. Moctezuma had thus broken his own laws. The ruler, taken aback by this reproof, insisted on giving as a present his mantle that lay that by its richness was worth a whole village. The next day, he sent for the owner of the garden. When the man entered his presence, trembling with fear, Moctezuma told his, att his attendants that this was the man who had taken his garment. They were naturally indignant, but the ruler calmed them thus. This miserable fellow has more courage and strength than all those here present because he dared tell me that I had broken my laws, and he spoke the truth. So intent was Moctezuma upon securing the incorruptibility of his judges that it is told, perhaps apocryphally, that he actually disguised himself to watch their conduct. If any erred, they themselves incurred the, de the death penalty. Moctezuma was not slow to show his hand as a ruler. As soon as this lord was elected and felt himself in the royal throne of, of Mexico, he wanted to make evident the grandeur of his notions, both as to what a king should possess and as to the esteem due to his person. He was determined to deprive many subordinates of their posts because he wished everything to be as he desired it, and not simply as previously ordained by his predecessor. With this in mind, he sent for the woman's name, or Chihuacoat. The office had become virtually hereditary, and its holder was still the second in the land, even after the death of the illustrious Lacaela. Moctezuma now decreed that all officials employed by his uncle were to be replaced, whether in the capital or in the provinces. He was determined to make a clean sweep. Because many of them, the former of officials, were of low descent, and it was most unworthy that kings should employ such people. He wished to employ those of his own class. Firstly, to do honor to his person, and secondly, because if the sons of the great lords and of his cousins and brothers were always at his side and in his presence, they would learn courtly language and behavior and the art of government in preparation for such time as this fell to their lot. 
particularly to be favored were the distressed gentry, such as descendants of former rulers, now fallen upon hard times. In future, miserable commoners whose merits had gained them knight knighthood were no longer to take precedence over men of noble lineage, now consigned to poverty and oblivion. The unfortunate woman snake demurred somewhat. Great lord, you are wise and powerful, and certainly you are able to do all that you will. But it seems to me that this may be taken amiss, because people will judge that you wish to denigrate former monarchs by undoing their works. Moctezuma, however, insisted and the woman snake was compelled to conduct a search of the most fashionable quarters of Tenochtitlan in pursuit of suitably blue-blooded recruits for the palace staff. The outstanding qualification was to be noble and of legitimate birth. No natural sons were to be admitted, including Moctezuma's own half-brothers. In particular, children of slave mothers were to be rigorously excluded on the grounds that they inevitably displayed the baser characteristics of their maternal descent. Moctezuma appears to have been motivated by two fixed notions. Firstly, he was haunted by the awareness of his predecessor's preeminence and popularity. His, re his reaction was to remove all whose might dare to make comparisons. Secondly, he held a belief of almost obsessional proportions in a kind of divine right of the nobility to supremacy in affairs of state. Because, just as precious stones appear out of place among poor and wretched ones, so those of royal blood seem ill ass assorted among people of low ex extraction. And consequently, just as humble feathers do not look well alongside rich ones, so the plumes that came from great lords ill, be Ill behove workers and their sons. In his meticulous new order, Moctezuma went so far as to insist on the purity of the language to be spoken in his presence, stipulating that only the Tlatoani's Nahuatl was to be employed. His royal commands must never be transmitted by coarse tongues. To please his, cap his capricious sovereign, the woman snake, having secured a suitable posse of candidates, actually measured their stature himself. As a result, he produced a hundred youths of identical height to be trained in his master's service. When they were duly assembled, Moctezuma recognized among them the sons of many of his own relatives, apparently severed from the service of the state in the days of his predecessor, who judged men by qualities other than mere gentility. The, wo the woman snake addressed those chosen in eloquent terms, instructing them to take good care of the ruler's clothes and shoes, as well as his hunting weapons. They must also look after his mirrors, his medals and chains, and learn how to serve his meals, in the elaborate fashion later to be witnessed by his Spanish captors. As a passing afterthought, Moctezuma ordered that those who had served Awitzol should be immediately killed, so much, so much for the kindly king, whose amiable conversation and bounteous gifts of gold so charmed Cortes and the conquerors. Such actions on the part of the new ruler suggest surely more than a mere expression of pique at the liberal ways of his predecessor in office. They amount to a definite step in the direction of an absolute monarchy, such as was little known in Mexico. At the same time, they constitute a kind of counter-revolution. People of humbler origin who had risen through merit and marital prowess were actually to lose rank, being supplanted by impoverished nobles. Awitzont, more accustomed to the camaraderie of the camp, had sought for talent where he could find it. Needing officials as well as warriors for his expanded empire, he had chosen some from the lower ranks of society, a tendency now sharply reversed by his more fastidious successor. That a ruler renowned for his wisdom should so define common sense might be hard to believe, were the facts not vouched for by eyewitnesses or their immediate descendants. As a general principle, communities tend to prosper when governed by an elite open to the talents. Moctezuma, however, was an able ruler and a skilled politician. There must, therefore, have been some method in his apparent madness. Whatever the opportunities that had been afforded to the to, that had been offered, excuse me, to the other classes, the the Mexican community, like most of the ancient world, was generally ruled by an established hierarchy. If the powers of the latter were to become too rapidly diluted as the empire expanded, the whole fabric of government might have been exposed to disintegration. As sometimes occurs even in modern Mexico, vi vitality in government may be secured by an alternation of progressive and conservative forces. 
Possibly the latter had favored the election of Moctezuma, and he was perhaps further influenced by their relatives. The underemployed nobles, who reacted against the intrusion of new elements into the corridors of power. In particular, the nobility as a whole resented the inevitable and continuous rise in status and power of the merchant class. These had always been important in ancient Mexico, but the triumph of Aztec arms had vastly augmented their opportunities for aggrandizement. Apparently, therefore, Moctezuma was motivated in part by personal idiosyncrasies and equally by a cold calculation of the odds. One wonders, however, if his conclusions were correct. His actions represented a check to the rising classes, including the merchants. His insistence on breeding as a passport to office might have produced a sharp reaction under succeeding rulers had fate not intervened so unexpectedly. Unwittingly, Moctezuma was perhaps preparing the way for the assumption of authority by the Spaniards, themselves no egalitarians. The, the second Moctezuma, inflexibly resolved to stand forth as equal in valor to his predecessor, led his first campaign in person. He sought not only glory for himself, but captives for his coronation. This expedition was directed towards Nap Napolan on the coast of Oaxaca. He found the enemy centers heavily defended and special scaling ladders had to be made in order to force an entry. Such tactics proved successful, and once the principal city had fallen, the, rem the remainder capitulated. Moctezuma took the lead in the operations, conducting the assault in person, in full battle array, and decked in plumes so, resp so resplendent that he appeared to be flying as he rushed forward against the enemy. After victory was secured, he issued a stern warning to the local rulers that any rebellion would entail their utter destruction. The rulers' actual coordination did not vary substantially from the already established pattern. The usual invitations were sent out, the ambassadors facing countless perils in the course of their mission. So great was the secrecy shrouding the presence of the enemy rulers that even the lights were extinguished when they took part in the dancing, which lasted for four days. Only large braziers were left alight to guide their footsteps. The gifts were more splendid than ever, and the lords of the various peoples received presents, each of a different type, to suit their fancy. For instance, the Tarascans were given arms and insignia decorated with golden butterflies, their wings painted blue. Moctezuma himself played the gracious host throughout, charming his guests by his attention to their wants. To these, the visiting princes, the great lord Moctezuma gave thanks, with a mien both serene and gay, and he received each lord separately with great courtesy, and made them sit beside him, in order of seniority, as they entered. After they were all assembled, he gave an eloquent address, because he was by nature an accomplished orator, and possessed such a fine gift for words, that he charmed and captivated all with his mode of, of reasoning and thus he left them feeling well rewarded and contented with his most amiable conversation. Nor were the sacrifices offered on a lesser scale as compared with previous occasions. In this respect, as in, as in others, Moctezuma was resolved not to be outmatched by his predecessor, even if the chronicler's figures of sacrificial victims need to be treated with a certain caution. After the main ceremony was completed, the guests joined together to eat the sacred hallucinating mushrooms, still to be found in Mexico today, though condemned in uncompromising terms by Padre Duran. When the sacrifice was over, and the steps of the courtyard of the temple were bathed in human blood, they all went from there to eat raw mushrooms. After consuming these, they lost their reason and were in a worse state than if they had imbibed much wine. So beside themselves and intoxicated were they, that many died by their own hand and driven by the potency of these mushrooms, they saw visions and revelations of the future as the devil spoke to them in their drunken state. Awitzalt had accomplished great feats of conquest, but, as we already know, these had not been fully assimilated or digested. Many intervening areas remained unsubdued, endangering communication with the more rem remote provinces. Not only Moctezuma's internal policy, but also his outlook on imperial affairs, stood in sharp contrast with that of his predecessor. During his reign, conquest continued, but in modified form. The general objective, henceforth, lay in the absorption of the free territories, interspersed between imperial tributaries, rather than in the subjection of more peoples, yet more remote from the capital.
The outer confines of Empire, resembling a skeleton in form, Moctezuma sought to add flesh to these elongated strands or bones by dominating at least some of the countless intermediate towns and villages that lay astride Aztec territory and still enjoyed a degree of independence. One can compile a long list of places differently cited in various sources as subdued by Moctezuma II. Moreover, the, fr the frequency with which certain place names recur throughout Mexico often renders difficult their exact identifications. Equally, where conquests are concerned, the identity of the reign or ruler is not always clear. The list of places which pay tribute to the Aztecs in the final stages are much fuller than those which define the conquests of each ruler. For this reason, it is possible to trace in moderate detail the maximum extension of the Aztec Empire at the arrival of Cortes, but without knowing in every case by which ruler a particular locality was first absorbed. Tlaxcala and the other states of the same region will be discussed separately, since they are of prime importance both for the story of the conquest and throughout the whole reign of Moctezuma. Only second in significance was the independent principality of Tototepec, which still clung to an important stretch of the coastline of the state of Oaxaca. Fairly ample data are available for tracing Tototepec's frontiers at the time of the conquest, including the Codex Colombino, which was still in the possession of the descendants of the rulers of Tototepec in 1717, when the document was actually used in a lawsuit over the possession of the lands. Tototepec had already constituted a powerful Mixtec principality many centuries before the Aztecs appeared upon the scene. At the time of Ahuitzot, it was still independent and governed by its own ruler, but its sphere of influence had been progressively reduced by a series of Aztec conquests in the area. Under Moctezuma II, the process was accelerated but not completed. Tototepec remained defiant until the arrival of the Spaniards. It was left to Pedro Alvarado to achieve its complete subjection to the central power, obtaining in the process a rich haul of gold from the coffers of the unfortunate ruler. Farther up the Pacific coast, and immediately east of the port of Alcapulco, lay another unconquered territory, that of the wild Yopis, known as Yopitzingo. These tribesmen were distinguished more by their special devotion to the cult of the flayed god than by the cultivation of the other arts. This deity, as shown by accounts of ceremonies in his, in his honor, was almost equally revered by the Mexica, and the Mexican rulers even went into battle arrayed in the insignia pe pe peculiar to him. But feelings of deference toward the flayed god had not deterred the Aztecs from taking the lands of his devotees. Their free territory had been so reduced by the time of the conquest that they no longer constituted a serious military threat. They merely clung to an ample stretch of of rugged crags, bereft of cities, part of which the modern traveler must cross before the road descends to the coast at Alcapulco. These Yopis have always been a rustic race, spurning more of the civilized ways of their neighbors. The empire had long since absorbed such towns and cities as they had possessed, many mainly situated in the eastern part of the territory where the Yopi tongue was spoken, and still can be heard today. Moctezuma II had merely carried his farther his predecessor's policy, actually initiated by the first Moctezuma. The total number of places subdued by Moctezuma's forces was very large. His policy, aimed at the reabsorption of the rebellious territories and the assimilation of the free, was applied in many directions. In the extreme north, no details survive of actual campaigns. However, in the reign of either Ahuitot or Moctezuma, the frontier limits were extended, and such places as Zimapan and in Oshititpan were absorbed to become themselves outposts of empire. The Aztecs had now reached the point of, of no return in, in, this northerly, in this northerly direction. Further conquests would have merely involved the overrunning of nomad territories, difficult to dominate and even harder to tax. As a consequence of these new advances, the independent principality Medztitlan, which had held off previous Aztec assaults, became hemmed in by, a, by imperial territory. Metztitlan itself managed to retain a degree of independence, though many of its former subject pueblos now pay tribute to Moctezuma. Equally, towards the Gulf Coast, Moctezuma pursued an active policy of consolidation of previous gains. Many cities which had escaped the Aztec net were now added to the list of tributaries. The region served as a, as a granary for Tenochtitlan and the surrounding cities. In spite of the huge flow of tribute, there was a severe food shortage in the capital in 1505, and extra supplies were imported from the Gulf Coast. In Moctezuma's reign, however, wars were, were raged principally on two other fronts. Firstly, 
the armies were locked in seemingly endless in seemingly endless struggle with with Lashkala and her neighbors, a conflict that will be treated separately, and second attempts were made to complete the absorption of what now constitutes the state of Oaxaca. This area, long since a favorite stamping ground of the Mexican merchants, offered prizes more alluring than the arid north, or the implacable northwest where the Tarascans ruled. In Oaxaca, Moctezuma's military efforts on the whole met with success, though the operation was no routine one. Hard-fought campaigns were required to subdue the proud principalities of the Mixtecs, whose historical records still survive and bear witness to many centuries of independence and greatness. In his military undertakings against these peoples, Moctezuma did not re rely mainly upon lightning incursions, often favored by his predecessor. A process of systematic subjection was in initiated in the second year of his reign and lasted for over ten years. <coughs> He first faced a rebellion threatening the lines of communication with distant Soconusco on the Guatemalan border. Moctezuma, himself a hardened campaigner, led the expedition in person. Apparently on this occasion, he suffered less than his predecessor from the faint-heartedness of his imperial colleagues. On the one hand, the ruler of, Ta of Tacuba, newly elected, was anxious to win his spurs. Nesahuapili of Texcoco, on the other hand, was past campaigning and efforts to secure his participation in such exertions had been abandoned. Moctezuma was initially ac accompanied by his, co his coadjutor, the woman snake. On second thoughts, however, this dignitary was sent home on urgent business. He bore the rather startling instruction that he should behead all the tutors and guardians of Moctezuma's sons and the women who attended his wives. The Tlatoani evidently feared that his alter ego might relent for he dispatched additional observers to ensure that there would be no backsliding on this new domestic purge. As the army reached its destination, scouts were sent forward. They proceeded with great stealth, actually managing to remove kitchen utensils from the houses and to snatch children sleeping at their mother's sides. These were duly delivered to Moctezuma. To teach the rebels a good lesson, the ruler, far from sparing the aged and infirm, decreed the death of all over fifty years old on the assumption that it was they who had incited their juniors to insurrection. After returning to Tehuantepec, where he gave his daughter in marriage to the, to the ruler, Moctezuma made a slow return to his capital that recalled the triumphs of his predecessor. History relates at this point that, from the time when Moctezuma left the province of Chaltepec until he arrived at Chalco, during each day's march, of the princes and lords of all the neighboring cities would come out with their people. They placed themselves on each side of the route as in a kind of procession and so closely packed together that nothing could pass between them. The crowd became so still at the passing of the great Tlatoani and all heads were bowed, so that it seemed that the multitude was hardly alive at all. Moctezuma was meanwhile faced with problems involving relations with Tlatelolco, subdued by his father forty years bef before. He summoned the, the, the leading Tlatelolcans and blamed them for not paying the tribute that had been imposed at that time and for not observing the obligation to provide supplies for his wars. They humbly complied with his demands and as a sign of appreciation he thereupon freed them from their previous res restraints which forbade them to build their own temple. He also restored their right to fight as a separate contingent in his campaigns. The sister city of Tlatelolco was thus restored to a more equal status though no longer enjoying the privilege of a separate reigning dynasty. A leading member of Moctezuma's council continued to act as governor. Moctezuma's efforts to consolidate the Aztec hold over the Oaxaca region were widely separated in distance as well as time. In 1503, he took Achiotla. This place was one of many which had previously owed allegiance to the principality of Tototepec. It was renowned for its delicious tropical trees and the story is told that on one occasion a small but very special tree was brought from far off to be planted in the ruler's garden. Its flowers were so exquisite and so fragrant that its fame reached the ears of Moctezuma. For him, it was quite unthinkable that another ruler might own something that he did not possess, and he determined to obtain the tree, even if it perished in the colder climate of the Mexican plateau. Since the local ruler refused to hand it over, Moctezuma sent a great army against him and killed many of his subjects. The tree also died when it was uprooted. But Moctezuma did not confine his ambitions in the region to the obtaining of, bot of botanical specimens. He next proceeded to absorb certain cities lying to the northeast of the Principality of Tototepec, the principal center of resistance. 
This campaign he again led in person, himself directing the storming of these heavily defended places, guarded by two rings of fortifications. To take the last of these, gets out Depek. The whole, a whole battery of scaling ladders was required. Eventually, a, a breach was made in the walls, through which the Aztec forces poured. Moctezuma ordered that only women and children should be spared. On his return to Tenochtitlan, the pious ruler was punctilious in performing the prescribed rituals of the of the thanksgiving. Further campaigns followed, directed against two important centers, Yan Huitlan and Sosoyan, where Mexican merchants had supposedly been, been killed. These places were also not far distant from the borders of Tototepec, whose ruler lent military assistance to the defenders, hoping to thus stem the progress of the Aztec armies towards his own frontier. Yan Huitlan, today the site of a magnificent 16th century monastery, lies on the modern road from Mexico City to Oaxaca, but had apparently remained unconquered by the Aztecs up to this time. After Moctezuma's armies had taken Yan Huitlan, it appears that he himself was not present. A massacre ensued that included old as and young alike, and the devastation was such that even the fruit trees were, dis were destroyed. The people of Sos Sosolan, anxious to afford a similar fate, fled to the mountains, leaving their city deserted. In 1506, yet another expedition was, uh, was undertaken in the region, this time against Teuctepec. The city possessed excellent defenses, including four lines of barricades. The inhabitants were, however, foolish enough to emerge from the protection of their bulwarks and to engage the Aztec armies in open combat. Not surprisingly, they failed to deceive the latter by the device of an ambush and suffered a disastrous defeat, many captives being taken. Operations, however, failed to conform to the accepted pattern. The Mexican captains judged the actual city to be imp impregnable and retired without taking it by storm. Moctezuma, at first vexed by this check, consoled himself when he learned of the large number of prisoners taken. He arranged for their sacrifice as part of a kind of victory parade. Another major expedition was undertaken in 1511 when Tlaxiaco was conquered. This place also partly derived its significance from its situation on the Aztec lines of communication. The inhabitants had the temerity to purloin tributes sent to Tenochtitlan from distant provinces. Moctezuma, so kindly in later years to his Spanish captors, was a man who believed that the punishment should fit the crime. He gave instructions that, if the enemy resisted strongly, half the population was to be killed. On the other hand, if they surrendered without a fight, they were to be spared, apart from the, f from the few victims that would be required for a sacrificial feast. The Mixtecs of Tlaxialco, guessing perhaps what lay in store, offered only token resistance before coming to discuss details of their future liability for, tri for tribute. The prisoners met their usual fate. Moctezuma himself, after the ceremony, expressed his concern that the stone used for the gladiatorial sacrifice did not allow the prisoners sufficient room for maneuver in his unequal contest. Accordingly, a larger platform for the, for the purpose should be constructed. Thus far, only the more successful military undertakings of Moctezuma have been related. Indeed, when aiming at more distant objectives, his plans were well conceived and his objectives largely achieved. There is, however, another story to be told that runs in part concurrent to the first. His reign was to be plagued by the unending hostilities with the unconquered enemy states of the Puebla Tlaxcala Valley. In this direction, his efforts were dogged by failure. He provoked, but could not crush. This region has assumed throughout the course of Mexican history an importance almost rivaling that of the Valley of Mexico, from which it is divided by the snow-capped volcanoes of the Sierra Nevada. Any power that controlled both valleys possessed effective domination of all central Mexico. The great ceremonial center of Teotihuacan stood astride the two. The Aztecs' immediate predecessors, the Tepanecs, were careful to maintain good relations with the realms beyond the Great Mountains. In early colonial times, the Spaniards founded Puebla de los Angeles, which was to play a part in second only to the city of Mexico in the history of New Spain. It came to be a great cultural and religious center, assuming the role played by neighboring Cholula in pre-Hispanic times. As we have already insisted, Huesotzingo and not Tlaxcala had long been the leading power of this region. In addition, it of course contained other city-states apart from Cholula, 
each controlling the country immediately surrounding its, its capital. During the century following the foundation of Tenochtitlan, Huéxotzingo, ruled in succession by three remarkable monarchs, had carved out for itself a kind of mini-empire, absorbing one small neighbor after another. In the course of its period of primacy, Huéxotzingo had made the fatal mistake of helping the Aztecs to crush their, te their Tepanec masters, Tlaxcala, owing to the part in which it played in the conquest, has achieved a, mo a more lasting fame. But it was only during the reign of Moctezuma's predecessor that this principality began to emerge as the principal power of the Puebla Tlaxcala Valley. The Tlaxcalans have been one of the seven semi-nomad tribes who traditionally emerged from these seven caves from which eastbound immigrants never ceased to flow. They passed the Sierra Nevada and established themselves in their new habitat ostensibly at the bidding of certain fugitive Toltecs, the latter, expelled from, from Tula in the confusion created by the downfall of their empire, had already settled in the area. The Tlaxcalans, like the Mexica, had followed a somewhat circuitous route to reach their, their promised land and eventually established themselves on a hill situated on the opposite side of the river to the present city of Tlaxcala. From this they expelled the previous inhabitants. The Tlaxcalans gradually multiplied and prospered, though, de though developing on slightly different lines to the majority of their neighbors. An initial breakaway moment resulted in the foundation of a kind of sister city. Later, two further centers of population were formed, and Tlaxcala became in effect not one city, but a confederation of four distinct settlements whose respective rulers formed a governing council. Cortez's description of the government of Tlaxcala Comparing it with the contemporary republics of Venice and Genoa is not altogether misleading. Like the Venetian Republic, Tlaxcala was an oligarchy, and the principle of heredity, of heredity was firmly entrenched among its noble families. In matters of faith, the Tlaxcalan were perhaps even less equalitarian than their foes. It was all quite simple. The nobles went to heaven and the common people to hell. The people of Tlaxcala Gala believed that the souls of the lords and princes were transformed into cloud and mist, or into birds of gaudy and diverse plumage, or into precious stones of great value. On the other hand, the souls of the common people became weasels, evil-smelling beetles, li little beasts that emitted a fetid urine, and other low kinds of animals. The Aztec drive towards the Gulf Coast started under the first Moctezuma in about 1450 and caused consternation among the Tlaxcalans and their neighbors. Since time immemorial, they had enjoyed trading relations with this region, on which they depended for supplies of necessities and luxuries. The principal power at this time was still Huéxotzingo, though chroniclers tend to write more of Tlaxcala as it had already taken the lead, particularly, of course, Diego Muñoz Camargo, the historian par excellence of Tlaxcala. And thus the Mexicans boldly engaged in so many encounters and skirmishes with them that within a few years they were pinned within their own territory. They kept them encircled for more than 60 years, lacking all human necessities, since they had no cotton for garments, no gold or silver for adornments, none of the highly prized green and multicolored feathers for their ceremonial dresses, no cacao to drink or salt to eat. The writer adds that the blush Galans became so unaccustomed to the use of salt that even after the conquest they consumed little. During this period, the Tlaxcalans and their neighbors pursued a somewhat equivocal policy. They simply offered half-hearted assistance to the peoples of the coast against the Aztecs, sufficient to arouse the wrath of the latter, while inadequate to save the independence of the former. For instance, when Oritaba was attacked, the Tlaxcalans pro provoked the inhabitants to resist, but offered only verbal support. The Tlaxcalans were more disposed to fight to the last Oritaba. It has already been related how actual hostilities against the people of the Puebla Tlaxcala Valley were initiated after the Great Famine of 1455. Such conflicts, dir directed mainly against Huéxotzingo at this stage, were frequent and continued under the successive Aztec rulers who preceded Moctezuma II. According to the traditional accounts, they were of a predominantly ritual nature and were thus styled wars of flowers. Undoubtedly, this aspect was present and even paramount in such encounters at the outset, though the fighting was often bitter. The desire on both sides for a good haul of prisoners for their gods, possibly at this stage, outweighed the ambitions to conquer. 
It should be recalled that these encounters coincided with spectacular Aztec campaigns which led their armies so far afield and offered Richard prizes in all other respects. Typical of such conflicts was the war against Huesotzingo in 1499, rec recounted on pages 191 and 192 above. It was on this occasion that the famous Totecat abandoned his game of, pel of pelota and, rushing virtually unarmed to the field of battle, routed the Aztecs, being rewarded for his prowess with the rulership of Huachotzingo. The War of Flowers was, was on the way to becoming a bed of thorns. Whatever the previous motives of such encounters, with the accession, with the accession of Moctezuma II, everything changed. The flowers were cast aside and hostilities begun in earnest. Moctezuma's efforts were not to be confined to ordering the affairs of his personal staff. He was to be master in his own house in a more ample sense of the word. Defiant neighbors were no longer to be tolerated, and he would wipe from the face of the earth such recalcitrant pockets of resistance as Tlaxcala and its friends. His determination was to destroy Tlaxcala and lay it waste since it was not fitting that in the government of the world the wishes and commands of more than one man should prevail. As long as Tlaxcala remained to be conquered, he could not hold himself to be supreme ruler of the world. It was in the second year of his reign that Moctezuma resolved to conquer Tlaxcala. In 1504, war broke out in earnest and was to last intermittently until the conquest in which Tlaxcala itself was to play so notable a part. It began through a conflict between Tlaxcala and, Hu and Huachotzingo, normally allied to each other. The latter made a deep incursion into Tlaxcalan territory, penetrating to within a few miles of Tlaxcala itself. They were repulsed, and the Tlaxcalans, in turn, in their turn, invaded Huachotzingo and burnt the crops. At this point, Moctezuma intervened. In one of his first encounters of the ensuing struggle, the Aztec armies suffered a grave defeat. Moctezuma's wrath was now roused to its fullest extent. He, assum he assembled a vast army, but even such a force was unable to overcome the Tlaxcalan will to resist. Not long after these events, in 1507, the, M the Mexicans formally celebrated for the last time the new fire ceremony, marking the commencement of a new 52-year cycle. As they once again broke their pots and pans, shut in their children and pregnant women, and extinguished all fires, who would have believed that long before the new cycle ran its course, they would be forced to worship new, new gods, and that when these events came to pass, it would not be just their crockery, but the very images of their beloved deities that would be broken in pieces. Many accounts tell of the continuation of the war against Tlaxcala, Lash both before and after the new fire though it is not always easy to reconcile the different versions. Significantly, between 1508 and 1513, on several occasions, Aztec forces attacked Huachotzingo, which they had so recently rescued from Tlaxcala. Apparently, therefore, during this period, Huachotzingo again changed sides, tending to revert to its more traditional association with Tlaxcala in opposition to the Aztec Empire. In 1515, a new phase of the war began. Once more, Huachotzingo, again hard-pressed and once more at war with Tlaxcala, appealed to Moctezuma for help. As a, as a result, Aztec forces virtually occupied the territory of Huachotzingo, while many of the inhabitants, including the, ru the ruler, took refuge in Tenochtitlan. However, in various engagements with the Tlaxcalans, the Aztecs were unable to force a victory, and indecisive campaigns and even defeats followed, the news of which reduced Moctezuma to tears. In one of these hard-fought battles, the Mexicans were defeated, the majority being killed or taken prisoner, and all the leaders of the army remained in enemy hands. On the other hand, the Aztec forces succeeded in taking a mere 60 prisoners. Moctezuma's own reaction to such a catastrophe was violent. How have you succumbed in this effeminate manner that I should be shamed before all the world? To what end did so many brave lords and captains go forth, so well trained and experienced in war? Is it possible that they have forgotten how to order and reinforce their ranks, to break through any enemy? I can only believe that you have been purposely slothful, to strike a blow at myself and make fun of me. But short-lived signs of royal displeasure were not enough. Strong disciplinarian that he was, Moctezuma made up his mind that his army was becoming a feat. 
he took drastic steps to tighten discipline and to stiffen morale. He sent officials to the houses of the various captains with orders to deprive them of their insignia of rank, as well as the gifts of arms which, with which he had honored them. On pain of death, they were, for, they were to be forbidden to wear cotton clothing or shoes fitting to those of high rank, and for one year they were not to enter the royal palaces. The officials, having carried out their task, returned to tell Moctezuma of the despondency caused by his orders. The ruler, showing no signs of regret, consigned those whom he had punished to oblivion for a whole year, and thus they dressed like low and common people for this period, and were afflicted with great shame. At the end of the year, he gave orders for hostilities against Lashkala, that those knights who had been penanced, if they so wished, might once more go and win back their honors. The new battle proved inconclusive, but at least honor was restored, and Moctezuma himself appeared appeased. This whole episode had taken place quite shortly before the arrival of the Spaniards, and served to show that Moctezuma had not yet lost his fire. Finally, in 1518, the people of Huesotzingo were able to return to, to their homes. This was not due to any dazzling Aztec victory, but rather to a reconciliation between Huesotzingo and Tlaxcala. At the best of times, they had been rather unwelcome guests in Tenochtitlan, owing to commotions which they were apt to cause, including the burning of a temple. After two disastrous flirtations with the Aztecs in the space of 15 years, they preferred to compose their differences with the, with the Tlaxcalans and thus were permitted to return to their homes in peace. The ruler of Huesotzingo thanked Moctezuma for his help and went back to his own capital city. When the Mexicans sent to invite him to a ceremony in Tenochtitlan, they found the border once more guarded. Moctezuma's military exertions had thus served no purpose. Tlaxcala and Huesotzingo had both eluded the Aztec embrace, and the latter had now become dependent upon the former. He was, in fact, no nearer the solution of his Tlaxcalan problems than at the outset of his reign. Much blood had been shed, and nothing had been achieved. Even the prisoner count had been disappointing, and the records suggest that Moctezuma lost more than he had captured. Notwithstanding the violent nature of the battles and the bitterness of the fighting involving the, fl the flight of numerous refugees, the notion persists that this was perhaps, after all, nothing but a war of flowers. But if native accounts were not sufficient evidence, the Spaniards, at that time ignorant of the internal politics of Mexico, bear ample witness to the hatred with which the Tlaxcalans bore the Mexicans, and of their straitened circumstances as a result of the blockade. The Aztec economic sanctions had not achieved their objective, but had reduced the Tlaxcalans to a point where, as Munoz Camargo re recalled, they lacked salt, a product most essential in the pre-Hispanic economy. They were even driven to extract from their own soil a kind of synth synthetic salt. The notion that Moctezuma never seriously wanted to overthrow Tlaxcala rests upon the doubtful supposition that a great power, by the application of superior resources, can always suppress a, s a smaller one if it so wishes. One surely need not search far into the annals of contemporary history to find exceptions to this rule. Admittedly, Tlaxcala Kala as a conquered province would not offer exciting prospects to the Aztec tribute gatherer. Moreover, the inhabitants would have proved unruly subjects. It is therefore possible that Moctezuma was not over anxious to annex Tlaxcala physically. By sheer weight of numbers, he had sought to overcome its resistance, probably intending to reduce this enemy to the role of, of a satellite or subordinate. His efforts had failed miserably. For once, as previously in the case of the, Tar the Tarascans, the Aztecs encountered a people resolved to defend their independence. Faced by such valor, their big battalions achieved little. The Tlaxcalans fought all the harder for being outnumbered, having more to lose than their opponents. Moctezuma's failure was to have a momentous effect on the future course of events. When Cortez arrived, he found the Tlaxcalans roused but not routed. This concludes Chapter 7.